Well, on Monday, we focused quite a bit on the mercy of the Father, as described by Jesus in the parable of the lost sons, or commonly called the prodigal son. In this evening's Bible study, I'd like to focus on how God welcomes sinners home from the far country and treats them as children as if they had been perfectly obedient and never squandered their inheritance. Um, God's mercy isn't God surrendering his holiness to forgive us and then just show us um, like a worldly understanding of kindness. He isn't like, oh, you sinned, you committed an eternal crime of hatred against my holiness, my holy person as God. Oh, don't worry about it. I forgive you. How can I possibly expect you to be perfect? Well, the bad news is that God does expect you to be perfect. Um, Jesus, in his famous Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, he says this, um, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an yoda, not a dot, not it will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus didn't come to remove the law so God can say, don't worry about it. No, God expects perfection because God is perfect. As John says, God is light, and in him is no darkness. Not even one blemish is permitted to stand before God without justice. Obedience far higher than even the Pharisees and scribes is expected, Jesus teaches us. God is strict. God doesn't budge on his perfect holiness. There's no compromise. Jesus, in great mercy, came to fulfill the law that we could not obey. Jesus ends his intro to the law of God in his Sermon on the Mount, where he also says, you have heard it said, then makes the law stricter than the uh, audience originally understood it. It isn't just the act of adultery, it's even looking at a woman lustfully. It isn't uh, retaliating against those who strike you or steal from you, you let them strike the other cheek and take more. It isn't simply the act of murder, it is the murder that is found in the heart to be angry with your brother. Then Jesus says this very shocking word to end chapter 5 of Matthew, You must be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In um, 1 Peter 1, Peter refers to the Gentile and Jewish Christians as elect exiles of the dispersion encouraging these suffering Christians that this world that we live in, along with all of its pains and trials and, for them, coming persecutions, are not permanent, but are perishing away, unlike our inheritance, um, which is kept in heaven imperishable. Um, life and joy and, and treasure of heaven uh, does not fade, does not die, but is everlasting and kept in heaven for us. Peter details the mercy of our God who gave us the new birth in Christ, protects us, gives us his mercy to rejoice in here on earth. Yet here, in the midst of describing the very rich mercies of God and his promised heaven, which he is guarding and preserving for us, Peter says this in chapter 1 and verses 15 through 16. He says, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. It's everything you do. Since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, in everything you think, say, and do, because you are to be holy as God is holy. I've had several Christians, including those who would consider themselves very mature Christians, come and tell me that God never expects perfection, and he would even be unfair to do so. 
Be holy, Peter says. Well, how holy? Well, then Peter pulls from the law, the Torah of God. As God is holy, you must have and behave in perfect righteousness of God, who and who through Jesus, who did not come to abolish the law, as he said. We're not even to teach to relax one of them. In Galatians 3, verses 10 through 11, Paul says this, All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. If you want to be right with God, you must adhere to God's law perfectly. Yet, we are justified, that is, made perfectly right before God, by faith alone, in Christ alone, says Paul. The just, that is, the righteous ones, shall live by faith, and by faith alone. In Christ you are perfect. That is, you are justified by his blood to stand as perfect before God. Not not by any of your works, but only Christ and his works. He is the righteousness of God to be received by faith alone. That is, by trusting in Christ and in his work, his righteousness is on your account. Peter even calls these Christians, and all Christians, a holy nation. Holy, as he is holy. We are a royal priesthood. All Christians, because of Christ's high priesthood, are priests to God. As a side note, it is interesting that within the Roman Catholic tradition, which considers Peter the first pope, um, Peter simply calls himself a fellow elder or a pastor, not a supreme pontiff, not a bridge, but points to Christ as our only bridge to God. And he even has the audacity to claim that Christians, all of us, are priests, not having to go to priests. Christians, through Christ, enjoy a perfectly restored relationship with the Heavenly Father. Jesus makes his church perfect. He justifies you. He, the author and perfecter of our faith, is just and the justifier. He justifies you. And you, the just, the righteous, shall live by faith. You are not only justified, perfect before God, you are being made perfect. You shall be holy as God is holy. You will be. You are being made perfect over time. In biblical terms, you are being sanctified. In Philippians 2, 12 through 13, Paul writes this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Um, to work out your salvation means to produce. Jesus saves you to bear much fruit, to produce good works. You have been saved unto good works, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 2. So work out your own salvation by God who's working in you, a salvation you not only have, but a salvation being worked in you. Paul says you are saved and you are being saved. You are justified, made perfect, and you are being sanctified. The expectation is that this prodigal son who has returned home is washed and welcomed by the father as a restored son will continue from this point living as the father's son, not to return back to the pigsty. Uh, we can read this in the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs is not a meaningless book. It is, uh, it is a wealth of wisdom for righteous living, for being the just who lives by faith. That is, uh, as Paul's language, we're putting off the old self, we're taking off the old clothes, and putting on continually the new self, putting on continually new clothes of God's righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul says, For the word of the cross, that is the atonement of Christ, we're going to think about this a little bit more deeply in a minute, 
that is folly to those who are perishing, who are going towards destruction and ruin. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, the power of God through the word of the cross to we who believe means we will grow spiritually. A life of daily repentance means we will be cleansed and grow day by day. We work out our own salvation daily, laboring and fear and trembling with the power of God that is at work within us, delivering us by the, from the power of sin. Yet we know also in the flesh uh, you will not achieve this demanded perfection in heaven. We will be delivered from sin's presence. And by God's promise, you will be, you shall be holy. You will be perfect. That is, you will be glorified, as Paul tells us in Romans 8. The glorified body is so much more than simply a body without aches and pains never to die again. Although it is nothing less than this. It is perfect. It is a perfect body. We will one day be like Jesus in his resurrection. By God's grace alone, received by faith alone, in Christ alone, you are made right, that is justified, by Christ's perfect obedience to the Father for you. He is washing you, his church, with the water of his word alone, that is, he is sanctifying you. And he will present his church, his bride, to himself, Without spot or blemish or any such thing, a bride in pure white, dressed in his clothes of his righteousness, we will be glorified. The command to be perfect like God, to be holy as he is holy, is met with the perfection of Jesus Christ, who is the righteousness of God for us. This great mercy of God is what Jesus describes in his parable of the lost sons. The prodigal son isn't required to do anything to make it right with his father. The father chooses to show mercy. He chooses to restore his lost son who is now found. His son who was once dead is now alive. Yet God doesn't compromise his holiness in showing mercy. The punishment for this son, the punishment for us as sinners, as we deserved, is placed upon the perfect Christ on his cross, which we must think about deeply here. We must de think deeply about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Um, in Ephesians 2, um, in verses 4 through 6, I'm going to read. Paul says, um, God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with, with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raises us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you can see the complete restoration as if we've ne not only never sinned, but as if we have lived the perfect righteous life of Jesus Christ. But come down to verse 13. Uh, Paul says this, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, like the prodigal son, remember he was in the far country, we were once far off, completely removed, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We are in Christ through his blood, that is his atoning sacrifice. For those whom Christ died and shed his blood for, there is perfect reconciliation to God forever as restored children, as adopted children. In Hebrews 2, verse 17, it says this, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect, that is, human like us, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a propitiation for the sins of the people. As he, in a, as priest, as high priest, put the sacrifice together, who is the sacrifice? He sacrifices himself. For whom? Well, Hebrews says, for the people, for the sins of the people. Well, who are the people for whom Jesus died for? Well, we have a few options here from all the verses that we have read. Option number one, did Jesus die for every single human being? I hear this often, and I don't think people uh, think deeply about what the Bible is 
teaching. They have their own philosophical understandings. They're trying to mesh things together in their minds with philosophies that have been told, philosophies they want to hold on to, and they're trying to um, syncretize it to the teachings of Scripture. But let's think this through a little bit. If Jesus died for everybody, and if everybody for whom Jesus died for enjoys complete forgiveness, perfect reconciliation to God, never to be severed, and, and enjoy Christ's propitiation for the sins of the people, well, then everybody is saved. Now, this is a term called universalism. And th I think this is easily proven wrong with Scripture. So as Paul talks about that the word of the cross, that is Jesus' atoning sacrifice, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Um, this is a real destruction by Christ's judgment. Jesus himself teaches about throwing those who reject him into an eternal lake of fire where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus teaches about a wide path and a wide door that leads to destruction. So Jesus didn't die for everybody to be saved. That is easily disproved. Okay, then how about option number two, which I think is incredibly popular um, in our culture. Did Jesus die for the potential salvation for every single human being? Well, this would mean that Jesus suffered and died for people the Father will end up sending into hell. Um, to put the perfect righteousness of God in an escrow account that is only to be applied to those who jump the right hoops, I think really misses the parables as well as the doctrine, the teachings of Jesus Christ, especially in the parable of the lost sons. The older son would have had would have made a solid case against going into the celebration of his father um, receiving the younger son in, showing mercy when the prodigal son didn't realize the potential of the father's mercy. The father was just merciful on his own. There was no potential and there was no realization of the potential mercy of the Father. In another way, this potential saving power of the cross of Christ is taught in several circles. I'm going to just focus on a few. Um, in some evangelical churches, faith alone in Christ alone cannot save you. Um, you must add baptism, right? Because uh, salvation cannot be yours in Christ. You have to have a work so the work must be, well, there's got to be salvation added uh, with baptism. Or that you have to do some good deeds first um, to prove it to God. Uh, to clean up your act a bit before you are really and truly and fully and eternally justified. you got to walk an aisle in a church service. Pray a prayer with all the right words. With it, really feel it. Really mean it emotionally before God can really pay attention to you. And then finally, okay, I'll forgive you. Beloved. The father ran to the prodigal son before the son said a word. He loved you before you loved him. While you were an enemy, while you were dead in, trespass, in your trespasses, as Ephesians 2 says, Christ died for you. It was applied before you sinned. It is applied while you were dead. Applied while you were an enemy. Christ's atoning sacrifice was applied to you. God shows you who believe in Christ mercy because God is a merciful God, not a potentially merciful God. Not because you did the right things to realize his potential mercies that he has been withholding, hoping that you would do a few things first to prove that you deserve his mercies. I think another case of this, which is uh, much more severe, um, would be in the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, Jesus' work on the cross in the Roman Catholic tradition isn't really enough to save you and bring you all the way to God. It has the potential, but it doesn't. Ha it isn't, you know, applied perfectly to you. Um, Jesus' priesthood isn't enough, despite the Bible saying his priesthood is final and perfect, especially perfectly outlined in the book of Hebrews. So there are earthly priests then given to you to help guide you and mediate between people and God, because Christ's mediation isn't enough. Um, Christ's vicar, the Holy Spirit, isn't enough. So there is added to this a pope, 
and church powers in government to serve as vicars to make up where Jesus falls short. For God to hear your prayer and do anything about stuff that you're praying about, you need more merits than what Christ gives, or he only potentially gives, if you can acquire enough merits around you to get the merits of Christ applied to you, that God would hear your prayers and there would be enough mediation between you, a sinner, and God. You must perform sacrifice sacraments to earn more favor. You must have like dead saints um, to have enough good works on earth. They're now dead to help you be heard in prayer by their prayers to God because Jesus' good works on earth isn't enough. And his intercession that is outlined perfectly in Romans 8 isn't enough. So even then, when you die, remaining sins must be purged in purgatory because Jesus' works wasn't enough to save you. It wasn't enough to purge you of all of your sins and apply to you the perfect righteousness of God on your account through Jesus Christ. So the cross of Christ has good potential in the Roman Catholic tradition, but never really lives up to that potential because you cannot adequately realize his full potential. So what progresses this potential? How can I apply this potential salvation to myself with any measure of confidence and be completely saved? And if salvation is only in the potential saving power of Jesus Christ and the potential saving sacrifice of him crucified, how can I be assured of his salvation and realize this salvation perfectly enough in anything I say or do or feel? If I must do things and say things first to enjoy this potential salvation, can I say and do the wrong things and potentially lose this salvation? I think it's safe to say um, that the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus' work on the cross is simply a potential saving work. That is an actual and a real saving work. So then we're left with option three. Did Jesus die for and fully and actually save only his people. And not just potentially, and not everyone. But did Jesus really die and really save those who believe and trust in him? That is, those who trust in him alone, that Jesus can actually save, that Jesus fully obeyed the Father, that Jesus' atoning sacrifice is enough. And the, 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 God, the Father's promises of salvation, which is really and fully actualized in Jesus' atoning work on the cross, that simply having faith in Jesus Christ, in his person, and in his work, and nothing in me, that he can save me. His people are all kinds of people. That's what this means. All kinds, all types, every tongue, every tribe, every nation from every background, from every level of wickedness. Jesus applies his righteousness, the perfect righteousness of God, by who he is and his work on the cross to really save his people, to really save those who put their trust in him. Not hopefully save them. Not Jesus wishes to save you. He really saves his church, his bride. Early on in my Christian life, I really struggled with whether or not I said enough or did enough for God to really forgive me and save me. Um, would God really welcome me into his heaven with this sin-plagued flesh and heart? Did I ask Jesus to save me with the right words? Was there like a magical word or a magical formula? Not just the words. Did I say it enough with, emo with enough emotion? Did I really, really, really mean it? Because, you know, you start with, did I mean it? Do they really mean it? Did I really, 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 really mean it? Could God save me while alone in my college dorm room? Or do I have to go to a church service and walk the aisle like my friends did? Even then, what if I don't confess all of my sins? Like I just forget some sins and I'm not 
I, I didn't I didn't confess every single sin or maybe um with I didn't confess each sin with enough emotion or when I talked to the preacher walking forward is my testimony before the church enough did I leave anything out when I gave a testimony to the church was I emotional enough in church to, for God to pay attention to me and actually um fully invest the potential salvation that he is offering no it's none of those things there is not a mention of the prodigal son's emotional response or if he did enough or said enough in the parable that Jesus teaches. The focus of Christ's teaching is on the mercy of the Father as is in our salvation, beloved. Take encouragement in this. The, the focus is on the mercy of our Heavenly Father who provided all he requires of us in his perfect law which he is not budging on. And Jesus Christ, who accomplished what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not accomplish. By sending Jesus in the flesh, God condemned sin in the flesh. Once for all sins of his people, Jesus, as the final and the perfect priest, the one true mediator between God and man, yes, Jesus accomplished Perfectly. So his word on the cross, Tetelestai, it is finished. Jesus on the cross finished, accomplished salvation for his people, not in potential, but in reality. So this salvation is yours. Go to the Father lowly. I am not worthy to be called your son. I'm not worried that you be called your child. Look to Christ, who perfectly obeyed the Father, perfectly obeying the full law of God for you. And if Christ is your righteousness, you are justified. You don't have to go and say, well, I wonder if I just confessed this emotionally enough. I wonder if I confessed enough. I wonder if I've done enough. I wonder if I've gained the attention of God enough by what I'm saying and doing. I wonder if I just had the right words. Or can I just, with groaning too deep for words, beating my chest to say, have mercy on me, a sinner. Can God show mercy? Yes. If Christ is your righteousness, you are justified. You are being washed. You are being sanctified. And you will be glorified. Hold on to the promise of the Father. Go to the Father of all comfort and all mercy through Jesus Christ. He is our guarantee of being right before God. That is justified. To be cleansed, sanctified, to grow spiritually. And in Christ, though we die, yet shall we live with him forever. As we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and we will be glorified. I will end with this prayer in the prayer of the, the Valley of Vision, a uh, compilation of the prayers of the Puritans. And this one's on assurance. And I think at the end of this lesson, this is something I need, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that this encourages you. Almighty God, I am loved with everlasting love. Clothed in eternal righteousness, my peace flowing like a river, my comforts many and large, my joy and triumph unutterable, my soul lively with the knowledge of salvation, my sense of justification unclouded. I have scarce anything to pray for. Jesus smiles upon my soul as a ray of heaven, and my supplications are swallowed up in praise. How sweet is the glorious doctrine of election, when based upon thy word and wrought inwardly within the soul. I bless thee that th thou wilt keep the sinner thou hast loved, and hast engaged that he will not forsake thee, else I will never get to heaven. I wrong the work of grace in my heart. If I deny my new nature and my eternal life, if Jesus were not my righteousness and redemption, I would sink into the nethermost hell by my misdoing, shortcomings, unbelief, unlove. If Jesus were not by the power of his spirit, my sanctification, there is no sin I should not commit. Oh, when shall I have his mind? When shall I be conformed to his image? 
All the good things of life are less than nothing when compared with his love. And with one glimpse of thy electing favor, all the treasures of a million worlds could not make me richer, happier, more contented, for his unsearchable riches are mine. One moment of communion with him, one view of his grace, is ineffable, inestimable. But, O oh God, I could not long after thy presence if I did not know the sweetness of it. And such I could not know except by thy spirit in my heart, nor love thee at all unless thou didst elect me, call me, adopt me, save me. I bless thee for the covenant of grace. Oh, we bless the name of the Lord now and forever. For he has shown us his everlasting grace and his steadfast and loyal love to us. May this be an encouragement and be blessed. God bless you all.